coming. Now, all of you that are here, and I see numbers of you are visiting for the very first time. It's an honor to have you here with us. Amen. Turn into your Bibles to the book of 2 Peter chapter 3. In 1980, a young woman's body was uh, found in a field in Colorado. After a lengthy investigation, her killing was not solved. But 40 years later, investigators used online DNA databases and they located a likely suspect named James Clanton. They got to his DNA and it was a perfect match. Sheriff Brad Whitehead said, your past always comes back to haunt you. He said, when investigators showed up to arrest him, they said, when he saw us, it was like he knew his past had caught up with him. Think about that. 40 years, he seemingly got away with it. How slow justice was. But then one day came judgment day. The text that we're going to read Peter is actually speaking about the last days, and he says all the world is facing judgment. And he says some people reject the idea of judgment because of the slowness of it coming into the world or into their lives. But Peter gives us the real truth, and that is that we're on a countdown to judgment. That's what I want to preach. Second Peter start, uh, chapter 3, starting at verse 3. Knowing this first, that scoffers will come in the last days, walking according to their own lusts and saying, where is the promise of his coming? For since the fathers fell asleep, all things continue as they were from the beginning of creation. For this they willfully forget, that by the word of God, the heavens were of old, the earth standing out of water and in the water, by which the world that then existed perished being flooded with water, but the heavens and earth that are now preserved by the same word, they are reserved for fire until the day of judgment and perdition of ungodly men. But beloved, do not forget this one thing, that with the Lord one day is as a thousand years, a thousand years is one day. The Lord is not slack concerning his promise, as some count slackness, but is long-suffering toward us, not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. But the day of the Lord will come as a thief in the night in which the heavens will pass away with great noise. The elements will melt with fervent heat. Both the earth and the works that are in it will be burned up. Therefore, since all these things will be dissolved, what manner of persons ought you to be in holy conduct and godliness, looking for and hastening the coming of the day of God, because of which the heavens will be dissolved, being on fire, the elements will melt with fervent heat. Nevertheless, we, according to his promise, look for new heavens and a new earth by, in which righteousness dwells. Therefore, beloved, looking forward to these things, be diligent to be found by him in peace without spot and blameless. Countdown to judgment. Let's begin. Let's talk about the principle of judgment. The great error that many people make concerning God, if they believe in him, is that God is an uninvolved spectator. Years ago, Bette Miller had a song, God is watching us from a distance. And so the conclusion that some people uh, come to is that because God is distant and seemingly uninvolved, we can live any way we want without consequences. Verse 3 it uh, speaks, and uh, says they're walking according to their own lusts. Lust is intense desire. This is how people live. Whatever I want, whatever I feel, whatever I feel I need or I deserve. Years ago, Woody Allen, the filmmaker, he dumped his wife and ran off with his adopted daughter. Why would you do that, Woody? And he made this statement, the heart wants what the heart wants. Woody was quoting the Bible and he didn't know it. Walking according to their own lusts. So our text speaks about the principle of judgment. Verse uh, uh, 2 Peter 3, 7, they're being kept for the day of judgment when ungodly people will be destroyed. 
Judgment in this case is, of course, punishment for doing wrong. Peter is actually making an, a logical argument. He knows that there are people who may be reading this and they will object to the idea of judgment. Some people, they're, they're uh, objecting. They are rejecting. They say, I don't believe in judgment because that's mean. How could a loving God judge people? So therefore, it's just not true. I reject it. But if you think about it, inside of human beings is an inbuilt desire for judgment. Any of you that have small children, let small children play for any amount of time. Very quickly, one of them will say, it's not fair. Where did that come from? Because it's in there. We, we look at <coughs> the uh, uh, things in society. People read of a judge who lets a rapist or a, an abuser or a murderer even off completely or with a light sentence and they are outraged. They say, that's not right. They should pay. The other day as I was uh, driving, we were in Pennsylvania, I saw the sign, mad, mothers against drunk driving. That was a mother who started that was outraged that people should drive while drunk. We should do that. They should be punished, caused a strengthening of the laws. Megan's Law, this is a sex offender registry to try to prevent. And then we have, of course, we've had demonstrations and riots in the last uh, year, some of which they're chanting, no justice, no peace. So in the world, in life, we understand there should be justice. There are things that should be made right. There are people who should be punished. So, but God is a God of justice. He is the one who wants justice. One of the things we no doubt sang <clears throat> songs and we, it would have talked about the fact that God is holy. It, it, holy is a word that means pure or doing right. God is always pure. He always does what's right. There, there are ladies, you know, my wife, she doesn't like dirt. She doesn't like mess. There are some days I come home like, you know, what'd you do today? I cleaned. I couldn't stand it anymore. Uh, I've never felt like that personally, but, uh, but uh, that's, that's why it's, it's like this has to be. The Bible says God is pure and he sees things that are not right. And he says, no, this has to be sorted out. He determines the rules. He's the one who created the world. And because he created the world and makes the rules, when people do wrong, Genesis 6 says when he saw the, the uh, wickedness of people, every thought of their imagination was doing wrong, it grieved him. That it is literally, it, it emotionally pained him to the point of taking your breath away. That's what that word grieved means. And so if that's true, now back to our text, our text uses the phrase day of the Lord and later on day of God. The day of the Lord. Verse 10, the day of the Lord will come as a thief in the night. So, the day of the Lord is when God enters this world personally and turns the focus to him. In other words, in its most simple form, the day of the Lord is saying, it's his day. Some of you, when it's your birthday, you've had friends or family say, it's your day. In other words, we are focusing on you. And, uh, uh, you know, wedding, on the wedding, it's, it's your day. So when people live in sin and rebellion against God, that's because our text says it's all about them walking according to their lust. But there is coming a day in which the focus, God says, now it's going to be about me. The holy God who demands justice. The day of the Lord is speaking 
Secondly, about a specific time period of judgment. This phrase, day of the Lord, is actually, we, we call this the day of tribulation or the great tribulation. It's talking about a seven-year period in which God said, says, for all the wickedness of the world that I have put up with, but now for seven years, I am going to personally bring judgment. People are going to get what they deserve. They're going to be repaid for this. And the Bible says in, in the, the, if you look at all the pictures of destruction, it gives numbers more than two thirds, between two thirds and three quarters of the entire population of the earth are going to die during that time. The day of the Lord is that time period of judgment. And then the day of the Lord, thirdly, ushers in the final judgment of all mankind. Verse 7, they are reserved for fire until the day of judgment and perdition of ungodly men. The God of justice has created a place of justice. The place where people who insist on living according to their own lusts, they will be repaid for what they truly deserve. The Bible calls this the lake of fire or hell. Je Revelations 20, 12, I saw the dead, small and great stand before God. The books were opened. Another book opened that was the book of life and the dead were judged out of those things written in the books according to their works. And verse 15, and anyone not found written in the book of life was cast into the lake of fire. This tells us two profound things. Number one, everything we do is recorded. God is the original CCTV. Everything is recorded. And number two, those who insist on continuing to live in rebellion against God, he says there is a place in which they will be repaid for all the wickedness that they've done. I was reading about a man, he said he was in a coffee shop, he had some friends he was having coffee with, they were not Christians and he asked, it was a couple, and he asked the wife, he said, what's the most important thing I can pray for you? And the woman was shocked about the idea of praying. And she said, well, uh, health, I guess. And he said to her, health, he said, health is not the most important thing in life. Sooner or later, your health is going to go, no matter who prays for you. There must be something more important in your life than health. And she was like, What? What could possibly more, be more important than that? And he said, what about your relationship with God? And she said, I, I never thought about that. And then her husband said, do you mean God is going to haul us into court or something? And this man said, when he thought about it, he said, yeah, that is what's going to happen. And our text calls that the day of the Lord. Let's talk about the problem of slowness for a moment. Because our text says... That is a truth. There is coming judgment. The problem is time goes by. And because time goes by with no judgment, that causes people to misread the principle of judgment. Verse 4, where is the promise of his coming? Since the fathers fell asleep, all things continue as they were from the beginning of creation. In other words, this is what many people say. Judgment, well, because it hasn't happened yet. Come on, the, the, life's been going on for thousands of years. Judgment hasn't come yet. So therefore, it's not going to happen. Verse 3, in the last days, scoffers will come, mocking the truth, following their own desires. Some of you may have seen through the years cartoons mocking the idea of judgment. It's a strange old man with a long beard holding a sign saying, the end is near. That's got, <laughs> look, at, look at that kind of weird, outdated idea of judgment. Are you a doom and gloom preacher? Yes, I am, as a matter of fact, because it's in the Bible. Some people say, because I've gotten away with it so far, and no judgment has come, I will continue to get away with it. Ecclesiastes 8.11 
because the sentence against an evil work is not executed speedily. Therefore, the hearts of the sons of men is fully set in them to do evil. The New Living Translation says, when a crime is not punished quickly, people feel it's safe to do wrong. So, because it hasn't happened yet, because I've gotten away with it so far, judgment is never going to happen. I will continue to get away with it. You know the problem with that? Many people don't. Lisa and I just uh, got back a couple weeks ago from South Africa. We spent seven and a half years in Johannesburg. Wonderful memories and getting to see what God is doing. But one of the things that always that we have memories of South Africa is the people who died. South Africans die like a lot. Many of them young. Lisa and I would talk about this. Someone, a name would come up and we remembered a young man in our church riding as a passenger in a car and his brother flipped to you, a car plowed into him and instantly went out into eternity. That young man, I am sure I'm going to see him in heaven. He was right with God. Another young man, someone came up to rob the girl he was walking with and he tried to fight. They pulled a gun and shot him in the heart. That young man, I hope I see in heaven. I'm, I, I think so, but I'm not 100% confident. We'll find out. But then, Lisa and I were reminded, had a couple young ladies, they were friends coming to church, and one of these, as often happens, she met herself a man at work. She's in love, doesn't want to come to church anymore, and lo and behold, the man that she chose was somebody else's boyfriend and they hired someone, a knock came at the door, and when she opened the door, somebody with an ax hit her in the face and instantly went into eternity. So, I am positive she did not wake up that morning thinking, you know, I could get hit with an ax today. How, how unexpected. You know what that was? It was the day of judgment. I've gotten away with this, but that doesn't mean you're going to. Second part of slowness is God's slowness to avenge violations against us. Somebody in the past, they hurt us, lied about us, violated us, and they seem to be getting away with it. Psalm 73, 2 and 3, as for me, I almost lost my footing. My feet were slipping. I was almost gone, for I envied the proud when I saw them prosper despite their wickedness. You know what? Some people in life, it, it just agitates. Look at them, look at them. They did wrong. And nothing is happening to them. And they let that twist them, and they forget. People get upset at violations and they wind up becoming violators, they violate God. He says, because slowness, judgment didn't come quickly. So, both of those, whether it's because nothing's happened yet or because somebody else is getting away with it, those are both completely misreading the facts. Peter says, God's slowness is not evidence that he doesn't care. It is not evidence that he's not going to act. God's slowness is proof of his love. Verse 9, the Lord isn't really being slow about his promise, as some people think. No, he's being patient for your sake. He does not want anyone to be destroyed, but he wants everyone to repent. Listen, I'm... I'm preaching on judgment. Some of you I know, maybe you're here like, oh great, I came to church, he's talking about hell. But, but listen, in the love of God, in the love of God, that is why he doesn't, the moment somebody does wrong, they don't immediately go to hell or drop dead. It's love. God doesn't want to send anybody to hell. He would prefer not to. He will, but that's not what he wants. So he is deliberately slow and patient. You know what he's doing? He's giving time so that people will come to their senses. 
There are people, they're living life according to their own lust, like our scriptures. But then they come and it's like, man, but I feel so empty inside. That's God helping you so that you come to the conclusion, the guilt you feel. You feel shame. It's hard to sleep. Look people in the eye. That's the love of God. He's helping you. So you say, I don't want to live like this anymore. Giving you time. Your sin is causing turmoil. Why keep living that? That's love. Why doesn't God judge those violators and send them to hell? Because they hurt me. Because he loves violators too. And he's giving them time to repent. The second thing about judgment is when time goes by without judgment, that simply shows that judgment is closer than it was before. Think about this. The Bible says God has a time. No one knows the day or the hour. God already knows the exact day that the day of the Lord is going to start. He knows that. He knows the exact day when you're going to die and face judgment. So let's just say that God has determined it's today at 12 noon. So Peter is saying the mistake that some people make, 12, you don't know what time it is, but some people are going, what, it's 1116. Come on, nothing's happened yet. So that means it's never going to, that is not what it means at all. All it means is you are closer to judgment than you were before. Go back to the story of James Clanton who murdered a girl in Colorado and for 40 years got away with it. For 40 years, nothing happened. Investigators say when they found James Clanton living in Florida, they said that he really enjoyed hanging out at a bar on the beach, just relaxing and taking it easy. Because James Clanton is like, it's another day. Nothing happened, so clearly nothing is going to happen. Oh, but James, that is not what it means at all. Think about it. In 40 years, there were people born who went to school, who became scientists and developed new techniques for detecting DNA. There were people who founded websites in which you can submit your DNA. There were family members of James Clanton who said, I got an idea, let's, let's find out our ancestry. And every day James is going to the bar like nothing's happening. James, that's not what it means. The clock's ticking. And then they locate the family and they start investigating. No, that one's too old. And that one's too young, and that person never lived. And then there came a day when they said, this is the guy. So slowness causes people to make a mistake. Let's talk finally about the perfect balance. Our text gives the perfect balance of both the love and the justice of God. Verse 9, God is patient with us not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. Peter says, listen, God will judge sin. I don't believe in it. I don't think that, that's irrelevant. That's like saying, I don't believe in gravity. Jump off a building. It makes no difference whether you believe in it. It's going to happen. However, that's not what he wants. Our scripture says he would rather people repent, change your mind about your sin. He doesn't want to send anybody to hell. The perfect blend of justice and love is Jesus Christ. Psalm 85.10 says, Mercy and truth have met each other. Righteousness and peace have kissed. That's very picturesque. It's actually prophecy talking about Jesus Christ is... God is a God of righteousness. He demands justice, but he wants peace. He punishes sin, but he loves people. Jesus Christ blends both of those together. John 3, 16, many of you can quote this scripture. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whoever believes in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. 
here is God in his love. God came out of heaven to live as a man. That's who Jesus Christ is. God in physical form that you can see. Why would he do that? To save you, not to judge you. He lived the perfect, sinless life that we had no hope of ever living. And then he died a horrible punishment that we deserved. He didn't deserve it. 1 John 2.2, 2, he died in our place to take away our sins, not, allow, not only our sins, but the sins of all people. In Jesus Christ, both aspects of God are at work. God says, sin must be punished, but I love people. And so his answer was, Jesus Christ was punished in our place so we don't have to. Righteousness and peace. Two dimensions of salvation we see here. So those that repent, number one, they get rescued from the judgment of the day of the Lord. Remember I said that seven-year period? Two-thirds to three-quarters of the entire population of the earth will die in direct judgments from God. But God says, that's not what I want. 1 Thessalonians 5, 9, God has not appointed us to wrath. In other words, he doesn't want you to be punished. 1 Thessalonians 4, 17 says, the trumpet of the Lord, we who are alive, believers on earth will be caught up. That word in the original language, they will be snatched away, removed as fast as you can blink. And God says, I remove righteous people, people who are in relationship with God, and then I judge those. So if you repent and say, I don't want to continue living in sin, you can be saved from coming judgment. And then you can be rescued from judgment in hell. This is one of the facts of people who know right, they often live with fear because they know that judgment is not going to be good. Before I was saved, I was raised in church. I knew right. I knew the Bible fairly well. And I knew, because I was a rebel, the way I was living, it was not going to be good if I stood before God. So I lived with fear. I was afraid of the rapture. If I came home, my parents were gone. Like, there's no answer. <laughs> Those days, there were no cell phones. It's like <laughs> waiting. <laughs> oh, they drove up, thank God. <laughs> Turn on the radios. <laughs> Anything bad happened. I, I live with fear. I get in the car. I'm, I'm going to ride in the back seat in the middle because I've heard a car crash that side, that side. I might live. Let my sister die and go to hell, not me. <laughs> but as a teenager, I got saved. Oh, the relief, the guilt that came off. Probably three years after I got saved, we were living <clears throat> in Australia and driving home from work one night, very heavy traffic in the city of Perth. A drunk was trying to get around me got angry that uh, I didn't move fast enough, and so he deliberately rammed my car on the side and shoved me out into oncoming traffic. Now my car is sliding, and traffic is coming. I'm about to have a head-on crash, and by the grace of God, the car slid, and I came to rest in the median, and no one hit me. And so I came to rest, and I had two you know how fast thoughts come in your head? The first thought that popped in my head was, I didn't swear. <laughs> that was like good. <laughs> because I used to have a foul mouth. I was like, wow, something bad happened and I didn't instantly cuss. Like, man, that's good. <laughs> but the second thought that instantly popped in my head was, I was ready. If I would have had a head on and gone into eternity, that wouldn't have been bad news. There was nothing to fear because God can, there are some of you here, oh, I feel it. There are some of you, that's what you desperately need. You need to be set free from the fear. 
of judgment. Our text gives the nature of coming judgment. It has a surprise element. Verse 10. Does not tell us the date of judgment. Anybody who comes out with a new book that telling us the date of the rapture, don't buy it. Don't waste your money. Deliberately, God will not tell you when. There's nobody here you're going to get an email saying next Thursday at 2 p.m., you're dead. No one will get that. It's a surprise. And in fact, our text says God deliberately makes judgment a surprise. And he does that to help us. If you remember back when you were in high school, maybe you went to college, you understand that there were two different kinds of teachers. And they had different approaches to testing, didn't they? One kind of teacher, he would tell you when the test would be. He would say at the end of term, right? End of May, middle of May. That is when testing day is. But of course, this is January. So for many people, that actually wasn't good to know that the test wasn't for four months or whatever, five months, right? Because it's like, I got plenty of time. Why study? We party and we have fun, we play. But some teachers, they weren't like that. They used a horrible form of torture called pop quizzes. Remember that? Like you're just rolling in there, you know, and you're looking at girls and they bring out a piece of paper, we're having a pop quiz. Like, no. So if you had a teacher who you knew at any moment could test you, if you think about it, I bet you learn more from that teacher because you studied harder, because <laughs> you got to be ready. That's what our text says in verse 14. Therefore, looking forward to these things, be diligent to be found by him in peace, without spot and blameless. He says, make sure you live at all times ready, because the day of the Lord is coming. There is a countdown to judgment. And he says, the answer to judgment then is be ready. Let's bow our heads. Close our eyes all across this place. Thank God. Now, I want to give an opportunity. I have preached about judgment, and I've given you the answer, and that answer is Jesus Christ. God is not willing. He does not want anyone to be punished. He will if you insist on living in sin, but that's not what he wants. And because he doesn't want you to be punished, he has made a way for you to escape. And that is Jesus Christ died on the cross. He lived the perfect life we had no hope of living, died on the cross and paid for our sin. So you can go free. I, I told you, I remember so clearly as a teenager, at a concert and someone preached and said, how many want to get right with God? And I was tired of the turmoil my sin was causing. I was tired of living in fear of judgment. And I said, I want to pray. I want to turn from my sin. God, I need you. I believe in Jesus Christ. And I want you to do a miracle inside of me. How many people are here as God would deal with you you are not right with God. If I was to ask you if today was judgment day, would that be good news or bad news for you? For some of you, if you're honest, you say that would be very bad news because of the way you're living. You're living, walking according to your own lusts, your own desires. But you can fix that. You can do what I did. You can pray with an honest heart. God will forgive you. He'll take away guilt, take away fear. He'll help you. How many here, you are not right with God and you want to pray this morning? If that's what you want to do, lift up your hand so I can see it. By lifting your hand, all I'm asking you to do is pray. I'm not asking you to buy something. You don't have to sign up. You have to pray. How many here, you say, that's me. I need Jesus. I want to turn from my sin. Here's my hand. I need God. Some of you are backslidden. It's a terrible thing to be a backslider, to know right, turn away, and then know what's going to happen. 
if the day of judgment comes for you. How many backsliders lift up your hand and say, I want to get right with God. God loves you. Amen. I see that hand. God bless you. How many others? Thank God for you. You want to be honest. Anybody else? Unsaved or backslidden. For some of you, there's a war going on. That's what used to happen to me every time I came to church. It was a battle. Part of me said, absolutely not. I'm not going to do that. I want to live my way. But part of me said, oh, oh, I need to fix this. How many here? You need to get right with God. Lift up your hand. God would deal with you. Thank God. Thank God. You want to be saved. Thank God. If you lifted your hand, someone there, you lifted your hand, look up at me for a minute. Did you mean that? Yes, you want to get right with God? Come here. Come out of your seat. I want everybody else to stand up. We're going to open the altars. If there's somebody near you that doesn't know Jesus, or if you're not sure, please ask them. Gently deal with them and give them the courage to come. But some of you need to make decisions about being ready. And God may have spoken to you. We're going to open the altars. You're welcome to come and pray. We're going to sing a song. Because he lives, I can face tomorrow. Because he lives, all fear is gone. Because I know. Sing it again, because he lives. Because he lives, I can face tomorrow. Because he lives, all fear is gone. Because I know. Let's praise God together right now. Father God, I thank you. Hallelujah, Lord God, I thank and praise you, Lord God, for your goodness. Thank you for your faithfulness and patience, Lord God. Thank you for your love. Praise God.
Hallelujah, Lord God. Oh, God, I'm grateful, Lord God. Thank God we're going to be dismissed.